Let's talk about emergency protective orders. Emergency protective orders often come up in criminal cases, but even amongst attorneys, protective orders are a complicated subject and lots of attorneys don't truly know how emergency protective orders work. So let's talk about emergency protective orders and whether or not an emergency protective order can be dropped. First of all, understand that there are protective orders that come out of the criminal code of procedure in Texas, and there are protective orders that come out of the family code. The code of criminal procedure in Texas says, for certain offenses, judges may or shall issue protective orders. So you have protective orders that come up in criminal cases after an arrest. Now, what's unique about these emergency protective orders are in criminal cases, they do not require a hearing. This is a judge on their own imposing an emergency protective order on a person who has been arrested. There's no requirement of any pre-existing relationship between the person that the protective order is over, that is the defendant, and the person that the protective order is protecting. In other words, there's not a requirement that they previously have been in a dating relationship or even knew each other. And that makes sense when you look at the types of cases where a magistrate can issue this protective order. Emergency protective orders come up in four types of criminal cases, sexual assault cases, aggravated sexual assault cases, stalking cases, and family violence cases. Now in the family violence cases, you do have that pre-existing relationship of it being a household member or a family member or someone you were in a dating relationship for. But specifically, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, and stalking those could be individuals that the alleged victim doesn't even know. So for that reason, there's no pre-existing relationship requirement in the criminal cases where emergency protective orders are imposed. Now there are mandatory protective orders and there are discretionary protective orders. You'll see mandatory protective orders come up in cases where there was some sort of an aggravated offense, like aggravated sexual assault, or you have an instance where a deadly weapon was either used or exhibited during the offense. Depending on the nature of the underlying offense, the length of the protective order may be 31 days, 61 days, and in the most serious cases, 91 days. It's also interesting to note that there are a number of categories of people who can apply for the protective order. It can be the victim, and that's obvious, but it can also be the guardian of a victim, and it can be someone in law enforcement. So we often see situations where the alleged victim did not want a protective order, and yet a police officer goes out and gets a protective order that applies to the person that's accused. Similarly, a prosecutor can ask for an emergency protective order even when the alleged victim didn't ask for one and a police officer hasn't asked for one. The second type of protective order that comes up is an emergency protective order or a protective order that comes through a civil court. And the statutory grounds for that type of a protective order comes from the family code. In this video, we're gonna talk primarily about the emergency protective orders that magistrates issue because those are the most common type of emergency protective orders that are granted in Texas. We often get the question of whether an emergency protective order can be dropped. And once again, this is an area of law that most attorneys are not well versed in. The first question is, who has the jurisdiction to modify the emergency protective order? Typically, the magistrate that we're talking about is either a city magistrate who has imposed the emergency protective order or a magistrate judge who works for district and county judges who is hired at the county level. Now, for these magistrates, emergency protective orders are one of the most serious things that come across their desk. So they're disinclined to grant modifications of emergency protective orders. In other words, if your emergency protective order was granted by a city, yes, the alleged victim could come to court, could testify. And what you'll find is more often than not, despite that, a magistrate judge will not be willing to modify the conditions of a protective order. However, the code also says that once the criminal case is filed, you can petition the new judge, that is the judge over the criminal case, to take a look at the emergency protective order. Now, what's different here is the county judge or certainly the district judge is a person who looks at much more serious offenses every day. And so their scale of what is reasonable and unreasonable is gonna be different than someone who works directly for the city and answers to the voters in the city 
or even a magistrate at the county level. So once you get your criminal case filed, it is possible to ask that judge to accept jurisdiction over this emergency protective order. So you file a motion to do that. And then you ask for a hearing after filing a motion to modify the conditions of an emergency protective order. You might even file a motion to rescind the emergency protective order altogether. And once you have this new judge, there is a chance, a better chance that it could be rescinded or certainly modified. Understand that criminal cases take time to get filed into a county court or a district court. It may take weeks, it might take months. And during that time, you have to abide by the conditions of the emergency protective order. Once your case is filed and the motion to modify or motion to rescind is filed, you will still likely have to wait for a hearing date. So until you get the hearing and potentially the judge rules in your favor, you still have to abide by the conditions of the emergency protective order. Now remember, the emergency protective order only lasts 31, 61, or 91 days. So oftentimes, it takes so long for the case to get filed and it takes so long to get the hearing that the result of all of that may be negligible. In other words, you might get a week or a month back where you don't have to abide by the conditions of the emergency protective order. That may be discouraging to hear that it could take just as long to modify a protective order as it would to just wait it out. But there's one notable exception that I would raise even at the city level or at that initial level of review. And that is if your emergency protective order keeps you from going back to your own residence. So emergency protective orders can do a number of things. They can require as much as a GPS monitor that you have to wear. It can keep you away from the alleged victim and the alleged victim's children. It can keep you away from locations. So when you get into that situation where the judge is saying you can't go back to your own house, you have to abide by it, but that is one of the grounds where you might see some relief and that we should certainly ask for a hearing because the statute itself doesn't give clear guidance on when the judge can do that. And you have a due process right to at least have a hearing before the judge says you can't go to your house. So abide by the conditions, but talk to your attorney about that in case that is grounds for a modification more quickly than you might otherwise see. Finally, understand that things like an affidavit of non-prosecution from the alleged victim is helpful Full. It's going to potentially help in negotiations with the prosecutor. It might be evidence that a judge will consider during the course of a hearing on the protective order, but it is not an absolute. Just because you have an affidavit of non-prosecution does not mean the magistrate might not still keep the emergency protective order in place, or even that a county or district judge wouldn't still keep that in place. So talk to your attorney about the benefits of having an affidavit of non-prosecution, but have realistic expectations about what that means. We made this video in response to questions that we commonly receive, as well as questions that have been left on our YouTube channel. So if you have a question about criminal law in Texas or any federal criminal law, drop us a comment below and we'll be happy to answer that in a future video.